Hey everybody, Dr. Dave Marquis here and I have some information that I wanted to share with you about inflammatory bowel disease. It's really a broad topic and it covers several different named diseases. I'm going to kind of throw a number together so that you can kind of get a 10,000 foot overview and then later on I'd like to partition out each of those individual diseases. Individuals come to us frequently with gastrointestinal complaints. Sometimes they have a pre-diagnosis where they've been working to try and calm down an inflamed bowel. Rarely do people have in mind the, the full big picture of what's really going on down there. And so I, I wanted to kind of lay out, like I said, a kind of a 10,000 foot view. When you think about the GI tract, you really need to think about the entirety of it. And it starts up here. It starts up at the top where things go in. And there's roughly a 28 foot pipe from top to bottom. And there's a lot of gates in between there. But there's some tissue that is contiguous from top to bottom. And that's immune tissue and nerve tissue. And so I, I'd like to try and address the commonality before we break down into the individuality. The commonality there is that if an individual is going to manifest inflammation in their GI tract, a couple of things have to happen first. Their immune system has to be aware and their nervous system has to be in more of a sympathetically driven state. Now I'm going to refer you to some of my other conversations on the autonomic nervous system so that you can understand the, the deeper dive on sympathetic tone. But in short, its nickname is fight flight and that's the opposite of its companion rest and digest which is the parasympathetic nervous system. So if an individual is experiencing more stress in their life, fight flight, you're going to start to have a reduction of the capacity for rest and digest to occur. So it kind of sets the stage, if you will, which is probably why you see the predominant age group that manifests for Crohn's, celiac, ulcerative colitis, IBS, uh, microscopic colitis. It's going to be between ages roughly 15 to age 40. And you think about well, when do we really start hitting our peak of stress? Well, it's in your teenage years and in those primary money earning years. That's when people are really at their, their apex of stress in their life generally. Now, I, I don't want to minimize other stressors that hit people at ages that are outside of that category, but that would be the primary bell curve. And I believe personally that that's probably one of the primary driving factors because during those periods of time of stress, we're also stimulating our immune system in a really adverse way dietarily. I, I, I don't know too many teenagers that are really conscientious as to what they're putting down the pipe, in other words. And that kind of extrapolates out through college where we're burning the candle on both ends and really just scrapping to get any type of caloric load that we can into our pipe. Well, going back to those common tissues, the nervous system and the immune system, well, where does the immune system kind of play a role? People might ask that question. Well, it actually starts up here at your adenoids and then your tonsils. And there's a thin layer that runs through the entire GI tract all the way down to the bottom called gut associated lymphoid tissue. You have another out pouching right there where the small and large intestine come together called your appendix. Those tissues are all lumps, if you will, of lymphocytes. The beta lymphocytes are the ones that kind of have a meet and greet, if, they, if you will, with whatever that's coming down your, your pipe. So as you stick food in, you've got these little sniffer cells that come up through the, through the enterocytes, right in between the, the cells that line the gut, and they're just checking out. Is this stuff okay that's coming in? Is it something I need to create an immune response to? Well, the more stress that you're under, the more hyperpermeable your gut becomes. And sometimes that's referred to as a leaky gut. And a leaky gut is, it's an actual real thing. The gastrointestinal lining, it's held together by some protein linkages. It's kind of like a, a biological form of Velcro, if you will. 
So this, this stuff, occludin and zonulin, it, it holds together the intestinal lining. And you can develop antibodies against that. If you're eating under stress a lot and your immune system starts to identify things that you're putting in the pipe as not being friendly to you because it's starting to leak through. And if you have antibodies against that, you're gonna to start to experience a breakdown of some of the lining of the gut. And then on the surface of the gut, you should have a ton of this stuff called microvilli, enough to keep the food that's going in the mouth off of the surface of the lining of the gut long enough so that that acid, that bile, the pancreatic enzymes can all work on it and break it down into its individual components, which ultimately become us if we get it digested, right? But most of us fail to optimize what we're digesting because of stress and the type of stuff that we're eating that's already nutrient depleted. So we kind of set ourselves up for this negative cascade that turns into different inflammatory conditions. And so then you may end up with any one of these named diseases. Commonly, it'll start out with a little bit of alternating bowel. So your bowels might slow up and you notice that if you go on a trip and you say, oh yeah, yeah I know how to, sometimes my bowels slow down if I go traveling. I hear that a lot from people and I say, well, prepare for that. If, if, if the stress of travel is impacting you, realize you're becoming sympathetically driven and your rest and digest is turning off. And so you need to understand how to tap into your autonomic nervous system and make sure that that vagal nerve is keeping your bowels working even when you travel. Because whether you travel or not, you should have a bowel movement every day, at least. Ideally, every time you have a meal, if there's enough volume of material going through, but at least once a day. And sadly, the national average is like every four to six days. And when you think about that, we're walking around with impacted stool inside us for days on end. Well, of course you're gonna get inflammation there. Could you leave a dirty diaper in your house for days on end and it not stink up the room? Well, that's inside you. We got to get this stuff out. And so that requires us to understand how to optimize our nervous system to keep the stimulus going and then keep the immune system calm so that it's not always creating inflammation. And then make sure we have the proper hydration, the proper fibers, the proper micronutrients to all act as cofactors to allow for the bowels to function and eliminate effectively. When we allow for ourselves to get to the point where our bowels are slowing down to every four to six days, it completely changes our microbiome down there. And when the flora gets switched over to those more fermenting species rather than the biotransforming, we've taken one more leg off of our chair. And it's pretty hard to sit when the legs start getting wobbly like that. So when you go in and you realize that your bowels aren't working and you ask the doc to help you out with that, if they're not looking at your nervous system function, so think autonomic tone, am I more sympathetically fight flight driven or rest and digest? If they're not looking at immune function, have you been experiencing this long enough that your immune system has now identified certain foods as not being friendly to your body? They don't necessarily have to be an allergy. They may not create itchy scratchy hives. They might not create anaphylaxia or closed airways. They might just inflame you. They might just make your muscles tighter. They may just cause um, swelling of certain tissues. Uh, so many people will come in and say, uh, when I eat X, Y, Z, I notice that my joints get a little bit swollen or for the next couple of days, my, my muscles are a little more achy or my bowels change. Well, those are, those are shots over the bow. You, you should realize that that's your body giving you an early warning sign that something's not right with your immune function in the gut. And you need to change your behavior at that time. And if you have so many of those question marks popping up, well, you probably need to do some testing so that you can get an idea of, on a, a larger scale, what has your body identified that's not friendly to you. But to immediately say, my bowels aren't working well, what kind of medication do I need to suppress this process? That, in my mind, is a failure because you're playing kick the can and you're actually shutting off more of the process of the body trying to help you. Now, I'm not saying that using medications for 
inflammatory bowel is a bad thing. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that there's so many steps that need to be taken before you resort to that. You need to understand why the body gets to that point so that you can try to change the mechanics, calm down the immune system so that you don't need to resort on the meds. I've found that if an individual allows their train to get so far down the track that they've actually caused tissue damage to the point where they're on the, the border of having to remove some tissue, well, yeah, you, you definitely need some medical intervention at that point in time because you've, uh, you've given your body way too much rope. And it's not always possible to completely turn around a process in a, process in a natural way in a timely fashion without some of the additional pharmaceutical support. But I would definitely say that in most cases, you can help an individual by understanding where their immune system went wrong, starting to support the tissue at its root where the nervous system is starting to create changes in blood flow and motility dynamics, and making sure that you're feeding that, that tissue all the, the key micronutrients, coenzymes, essential fats, and fibers, and, and supporting the, the flora appropriately. When you do those things, you're going to start to see the, the function of the entire system turn around so that you can potentially avoid some of these overt diseases before they actually have enough symptoms to become named. That's really the goal. Try to avoid gaining a named disease. Catch it early. If you realize that that age group of 15 to 40 is kind of the, the bell curve, well, it doesn't happen overnight. It's happening years in advance until it becomes symptomatic enough to become named. So our goal really would be to become more aware of changes within ourselves and take preemptive action. So I, I hope that that was a, a good overview to realize that things like Crohn's, colitis, celiac, ulcerative colitis, IBS, even constipation and alternating bowel, all of those have a commonality. Yes, they are different named diseases, but they all have a commonality upstream as to how the body allowed that process to occur. And then where your unique weak link is, that's where the tissue is going to start to manifest. So get with a functional medicine doc if you're noticing early signs so that you can start to evaluate your digestive tract appropriately and alleviate the potential of turning into overt disease. Have a great day.